Well, welcome. So this, this talk is about flex group volumes, uh, a distributed waffle file system. So this is a shipping product and is a joint effort amongst many, many smart people from NetApp. OK, so some of the key, some of the key takeaways that we're going to dive in more into detail. We wanted a distributed file system that could automatically balance load across a cluster and be easy for clients and admins while maintaining the performance and reliability of our existing technologies. While doing this, we wanted to capitalize on the many years of engineering effort and battle, and battle hardened experience of these existing technologies, like the Waffle file system and on tap clusters, which could do this in a manual way at the time. One thing that's different about this effort from other distributed file systems is that we have relatively uh, small, fast clusters of highly reliable nodes, and this changes the assumptions about how transient nodes can be. So Flex Groups is our solution. So um, we created a distributed file system out of local, wall, uh, local waffle file systems. So at the right is, a, is an illustration of these ideas. Each blue cylinder represents a waffle volume from a different node. Black, ob black objects are files and directories, and red objects are remote links that are used to, for load balancing, created when the heuristics think they're, need they're needed to keep the cluster balanced. So just to let you know where we're heading. Uh, so in the introduction, we're going to talk a little bit about the NetApp history and what led us to flex groups. Um, we'll talk about some of the, the problems we wanted to solve and the requirements on the solution. We'll, talk, we'll go into the design. And then in the evaluation, we have a really exciting part, which includes uh, customer experiences. OK, so just a brief history that to, for how NetApp got here. So, 20 years ago, uh, we had a single filer appliance to manage client data in a simple way. It used ONTAP as our customized operating system, and it used Waffle as our local file system. Clients accessed it over, using an, over a network protocol like NFS or SMB. The original system had a single point of failure, though, the filer itself. To address that, NetApp introduced redundant filers, or an HA pair, where each node is responsible for a bunch of volumes, but its partner can take over in case of failure. So using this, we can achieve really high reliability, like six nines, due to redundant hardware, analytics, and other things. So ONTAP clusters linked nodes together so that clients could access any volume from any node over a fast cluster interconnect. So clusters also introduced junctions, which allowed an administrator to manually stitch together multiple waffle volumes into a single client visible volume. So the issue with junctions is that they had to be managed manually. So what we wanted was something that could get rid of the administrator intervention by automating the process of data placement. We wanted to keep the ability for a client to connect to any cluster node to access any file with, with the fast cluster interconnect. And as mentioned earlier, we wanted to do this using our existing technologies that have a lot of customer experience baked in. OK, so this led to a few requirements. The first one is that it, we needed dynamic load balancing to spread both the space and the CPU load up among all the members of the cluster. Second, we wanted to require minimal involvement from the administrator on an ongoing base, basis. So this is why customers pay us, is to make things simpler for them. And we needed to maintain that. Um, third, we wanted to maintain low latency access to the data. And finally, we needed metadata that would scale with the cluster size. So this is how we came to Flex Groups. Uh, we evolved ONTAP cluster to stitch together waffle volumes automatically to make things simple for admins uh, who then could, through automatic placement that balances the cluster, as well as making it simple for clients who can still see a single mount point um, that can be mounted from any cluster member. Like before, requests can still come into any node and be routed. Every request will either be satisfied by the local node or a node one hop away. So doing this required two mechanisms that we're going to dive into in a little while. Um, the first one is remote links that allow us to spread the usage across the volumes of the cluster. And the second one is we use heuristics to guide when a remote link should be created, and if it is, where it should lead to. Now we'll talk about how that happens. OK, so to give an overview, take an example of a simplified cluster with, 
uh, with one volume per node. In this example, we have four volumes on four different nodes. Um, and, and so the red, the red nodes are remote links and the black ones are local, like before. So even though this example looks like a tree, any remote link can point to any volume. As we see the data coming in, heuristics are used to determine whether the data should be allocated remotely, and if so, it uses a remote link to place the file or directory there. So now we'll talk about these remote links and the remote access layer, or RAL, uh, to ensure consistency for updates across the nodes. Okay, so a big question is, how do you coordinate operations across multiple nodes so that they happen correctly? The way we did this was to make it, everything look local, similar to how things looked before. So we do that by using delegations, um, which cache everything on one node persistently. This is facilitated with the RAL cache, where remote inodes that are being accessed or changed, for instance, during file creation or deletion within a remote link directory, are cached in a local node. We can do this since local operations are considered reliable and persistent with things like the waffle file system and replicated non-volatile RAM. The cache is managed using delegations from the remote volume, which can either be exclusive for read-write op operations like create, or shared for read-only read operations like lookup. The delegation can be released either proactively by the caching node after it's done with it, or the origin volume can revoke caches, remote caches. All of this is enabled by having a durable local file system so that cache state will be maintained in the event of a crash and eventually made available when the volume returns. Okay, so now we're just gonna go for a, through a very simplified example of how the RAL cache works. So you can see the root directory in, on volume A in inode one, and within that root directory, we have a, a file called file one that has some local data within that same volume. And then there's dir1, which is a remote link over to uh, volume B. And so on volume B, um, under the directory I, for inode two, which is called dir1, um, we, let's say that we want to create a new directory and the heuristics tell us it's a remote link. So the first thing we do is we create the directory inode on volume C because that's where the heuristics said to go. But then since we need to modify it to do the initial creation stuff, we have to cache that in a local inode on volume B. So this is assuming that the request is coming through node two. So we cache inode three, and in order to do this, we have to create a couple of mappings. So on volume C, it needs to know that inode three has now been delegated to volume B. And so this L2R, it means local to remote, and it maintains that mapping in case it needs to revoke it later. On volume B, we need to introduce two mappings, one, because if we, when we look at inode 25, we need to remember that it's a delegated inode. And the other one is that in case we have to look up inode three again, we know that we're, we already have it. And so we, do, so we do all of our file creation stuff. Then we create the, uh, the remote link on volume B. And then finally, when, when everything is done through that cached inode, we, we, uh, we write out the dirty buffers. And so that makes this state permanent and we get rid of all the caches. Okay, so, so this brings up the questions is when do we allocate remote? And if so, where do we allocate it to? Uh, the answer is because remote links ha incur overhead, we want, to, we want just enough remote links to stay balanced. The default is to keep files with their parent directories because local files and directories don't incur the RAL overhead. These heuristics are calculated on block and inode usage and a moving average system load. So heuristics are currently only applied at ingest. For our customers, balancing at ingest time meets most of their needs versus rebalancing later. And we're gonna show you some evidence from, the, from our customers in a few slides to show you that that, that assumption is true. Um, these, uh, these heuristics are also done independently. So there's a, uh, amongst the nodes. So there's a gossip protocol where the nodes periodically let the other nodes know how much uh, space they have and how much CPU they have. And so, um, and, so, and so then nodes can make these choices on their own. Um, if the volumes are mostly empty, it's not as important to balance, and so we don't try as hard. In contrast, when volumes fills up, there are more, there's more urgency. And if you're interested in learning more about this, we have a lot more in the paper. Okay, so this is just a quick, sim another simplified example to show how we choose where to send a remote allocation once we decided that we need it. 
So you can see that we have several volumes here that have different amounts of free space. Um, the, one, of the, one, of them, one, of the node, or one of the nodes has four terabytes free, and another one at the other end has nine terabytes free. So you would expect there to be more allocations to the nine terabyte than the four terabyte. And so, and so we calculate likelihoods um, that are used. And so the likelihoods reflect that the nine terabyte would be roughly twice as likely to get a, an allocation as the four terabyte free volume. Okay, so now we're gonna dive into the evaluation. So our evaluation had two goals. The first one was to look at the penalty incurred by the remote access layer for metadata operations and see how they affected the workloads we care about the most. The second goal was to see if the heuristics actually achieved load balancing across the cluster. So all of the, all of the numbers we report here are relative. Um, so, so, our first, so our first micro benchmarks used uh, MD test over NFS to look at how, um, to look at the latency for, for certain NFS operations. So along the x-axis, you can see the NFS operations themselves, and then the bars, report, and then the bars within, those, uh, within those operations represent three different configurations. So the left one, or the red one, represents a local configuration where we use the predecessor to flex groups to ensure that all of the, um, all of the NFS operations operate on storage that is local to that node. The one on the right, or the gray bars, represent a, in a pedantic case, which is a remote allocation. So all of the storage is, is actually located on a different node, so it always has to go over the interconnect. And, they, and so we created these to give two extremes, uh, an ideal case and a, and a worst case scenario. So, uh, so uh, keep in mind that neither the local nor the remote have a, a, have a remote access layer, so this actually helps us to see what the overhead for the remote access layer is. The y-axis is a normalized latency, uh, and, so no, and so lower numbers are, are better. So um, let's see. So we have, so for the, for the left sides, we have no rel. And so what you can see is that the flex group numbers, the flex group latencies, are exactly where you'd think they'd be. They're right between the local and the remote. And that makes sense because flex groups try to distribute the data. It's neither going to be always, always local, nor, it's, nor is it always going to be remote. So it's right in the middle. On the other hand, we have these other, the, the things that use the RAL cache, and you can see that the flex groups do take more time, and that's because these are micro benchmarks that are designed to stress the metadata, and therefore create more overhead. Um, what's also interesting here is the thing that, so lookup, which only needs to take a read-only delegation, um, there's, there has a, has a lower overhead compared to the remote than the other ones, and that kind of makes sense. Okay, so we wanted to see the performance for some of the workloads we're interested in. To do that, we used the SFS benchmark, which is an industri industry standard workload simulator. Um, so in this case, the x-axis are different workloads. So the, the two that were the most important um, are the software build, which is a, simulates a metadata-heavy workload, similar to a kernel make, and VDA, which simulates a data-heavy data data workload without much metadata, and uh, which simulates streaming video. So we picked these because these are two extremes, a very metadata heavy one and a very data heavy one. So the, the bars are the same as the benchmarks, which represent the local and the remote. And the y-axis in this case is a normalized operations per second, so higher is better. So relatively speaking, um, the performance is better for, in the, on the left side, if we, if we take a look at the out, outputs, relatively speaking, the flex group's uh, performance is better for the, for the uh, benchmark that has more data than metadata. Um, whereas on the left side with the software build, the metadata-centric uh, the, the metadata software build is, very, is much closer to the always remote case. On the right side, we have, some, we have cluster scaling. So this is um, to look at how, how, do, how do flex groups scale as you introduce more nodes. And for the metadata heavy one, it, it, it the scalability is less than the um, scalability for the data heavy one, which is what we expected. Okay, so these tests are nice. But what's more, even more exciting is to see how well flex groups balance in the real world. So we were able to gather some data using our auto support program, which is an optional program where customers can provide telemetry feedback about their production systems. 
So this data set had thousands of flex groups managing hundreds of petabytes. We, we measure this by taking the standard deviation of the bytes used in every volume within each, each customer uh, flex group. But the, the issue with that, though, is that, each, um, is that each flex group is going to be a different size. So the question is, how do you measure how, how, uh, how dispersed it is? And so, so even though the standard deviation is a measure of dispersion, we needed a way to normalize this across customers. And so to do that, we used what's called the coefficient of variation, which divides the standard deviation by the mean to give you a relative size for the standard deviation. So, um, and so what, what's interesting here is that um, over, half of our, over half of the customer volumes that we, we had data about had a, had a coefficient of variation of less than 1%. Also, 78% um, of, the, of the customer volumes had a, a coefficient of variation of less than 5%. What's interesting here is that, um, was that the, there is this 22% that, are greater than five, that, that have a greater than 5% uh, coefficient of variation. And so we, we looked into these a little more deeply, and we discovered two patterns. The first pattern was that, um, was that there were a lot of customers who were starting to run out of space in their flex groups, and then they added volumes later. And interestingly, um, originally we would be much more aggressive about trying to fill those, but what we discovered was that actually can cause uh, runtime load, load um, issues. And so we actually do that a little more slowly now. The second, issue, the second group of, of, um, that, can, that comprised this were flex groups where they had a small number of very large files. And this is because flex groups are, uh, manage at a granularity of files or directories, and so we can't split up files. Okay, so in conclusion, flex groups showed that it's possible to take a, lo a local file system and make it into a distributed one with a couple of mechanisms like remote links and placement heuristics. What might be different than other circumstances uh, when building a distributed file system is that we'd already had a high availability mechanism to our, in our local file system, which meant that we could create a distributed file system without adding a lot of overhead for management. Uh, if you like this, we have about 15 to 20 more published papers on ONTAP and Waffle, and you can access those at the URL there. And with that, I would love to take any questions you have. Come down to the microphone if you have questions. Yeah, so I actually had a question. As somebody who worked in another big storage company for a long time, uh, EMC, the, that old one who competed with, a lot of times when you're building uh, on existing systems, you have a lot of challenges you don't have in an academic world. Um, how, did, how, were you, how would you have done things differently if you didn't have your existing system? Was there anything you would have changed? Uh, so I'm going to call on Ram Kasavan, who has actually was a, a key part of, of designing flex groups. That's a great question. Sorry, uh, I work at Google now, so I've forgotten everything about NetApp at this point. But yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think we would have gone about it very differently, of course, because uh, the, the fact that we had Waffle sitting there with like 20 years of uh, um, you know, solid stuff in it, we clearly built it on top of that because we already got great performance, great reliability, great everything. So we definitely would have done it very differently than uh, if we didn't have Waffle. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's thank our speaker.